All right, here's another common uh, objection. Um, and uh, it really comes to us from Sigmund Freud, the father, uh, father of modern psychology. Let me read a little excerpt uh, from him, and then we'll kind of summarize his little argument here, okay? So Freud, in, uh, if you look at Freud and you look at what he's doing with psychology, often what he does with uh, psychology is he takes it and he aims it, he aims psychology at religious belief, okay? And so this is what he says in trying to explain religious belief. He says, when the growing individual finds that he is destined to remain a child forever, that he can never do without protection against strange powers, he lends those powers the features belonging to the figure of his father. He creates for himself the gods whom he dreads, whom he seeks to propitiate, and whom he nevertheless entrusts with his own protection." Thus, his longing for a father is a motive identical with his need for protection against the consequences of his human weakness. The defense against childish helplessness is what lends its characteristic features to the adult's reaction to the helplessness which he has to acknowledge, a reaction which is precisely the formation of religion. So what's he saying? He's essentially saying, hey, there's a big bad world out there, right? As a child, you have parents who protect you, As you get older, you have to come to the realization, right, that you are helpless. You have to acknowledge that, and that then gives rise to religion. How so? Well, he says psychoanalysis, which has taught us the intimate connection between the father complex and belief in God, has shown us that the personal God is logically nothing but an exalted father. So, <laughs> and so the claim here is God is a crutch for the weak-minded, or God turns out to be a psychological projection for you weak-minded religious people. That's the origin of your belief. That's why you believe what you believe. It's nothing more than a psychological projection. But there's no real heavenly father out there who's going to protect you. It's just that you are, are, are not psychologically strong enough to admit this is a big, bad world, and then you don't have the courage just to simply face it. You project a God, and that helps you cope, right? So that's the argument. And so essentially, God is a crutch for weak-minded individuals like yourselves, okay? Uh, in fact, Richard Dawkins wants to take that one step further. Uh, it's not just a crutch for weak-minded people. He says, faith is one of the world's great evils comparable to the smallpox virus, but harder to eradicate. Religion is capable of driving people to such dangerous folly that faith seems to me to qualify as a kind of mental illness. In fact, he argues that you could actually maybe, I think he and Daniel Dennett both argue that um, that you could actually maybe make the case that, that parents, religious parents who try to pass on their faith to people are actually engaging in child abuse. Okay, he seriously said that. And so another form where he's just saying, look, you just, okay, it's not just a, a, a kind of psychological coping mechanism. It says that you just have a mental illness, <laughs> okay? All right, same kind of argument. So how do we respond to this? What is, what is the response to this? Well, I guess here's my question. Let's, let's just grant for a second. Let's grant for a second that I am a weak-minded person. Let's say I'm a weak-minded person. I don't like that there's bad things that happen in the world, and it really does bring me comfort to think that there's a heavenly Father watching over me. I'll grant all of that. Does it also follow that God does not exist? If I grant all that, does it follow that God doesn't exist? No. I mean, what's the connection? Even if I grant that I'm, I'm psychologically weak and I like comfort... You can't make an argument from that to the conclusion that God doesn't exist. It doesn't follow. In fact, so what we find is there's there's something wrong with this. There's something wrong with this. Well, what's wrong with it? Let me give you an analogy, okay? Let's say um, we take you back to uh, kindergarten math where you learn that 2 plus 2 equals 4, okay? And later on in your elementary or junior high or high school years, Someone came up to you and said, hey, who did you learn mathematics from in kindergarten? And you said, oh, that was Miss Crabapple. And that person said, yeah, Miss Crabapple, that's what I thought. Did you hear about Miss Crabapple? 
Oh my gosh, they discovered all kinds of bad things about Miss Crabapple. Miss Crabapple was caught embezzling money from the school. She's a crook. Then as they started looking into her background, they realized she didn't even actually have any college degrees or teaching credentials. She made it all up. She's a fraud. And now she's in prison, okay? And that's who you learn two plus two equals four from. So you better, you better rethink two plus two equals four. <laughs> right? You see what I'm doing? Am I going after the rationality of the claim two plus two equals four? Am I going after the truth of two plus two equals four when I do that? No. The person who are, and, and you realize, of course, obviously that's a silly argument. If you, if you say, well, because you learned two plus two equals four from Ms. Crabapple, and Ms. Crabapple's a bad person, that therefore two plus two might be false, two plus two equals four might be false, you realize that's a bad argument, right? So what's going on here? This is what's called, in logic, the genetic fallacy, right? In the word genetic, you see the word genesis, right? Genesis or origin. The genetic fallacy is where you fault an idea or claim based upon its origin or where it comes from. So if I learn 2 plus 2 equals 4 from Miss Crabapple, and you say, well, Miss Crabapple's a bad source, does it follow then that I should dismiss the idea that 2 plus 2 equals 4? Of course not. To dismiss 2 plus 2 equals 4 on the basis that it came from Miss Crabapple, my kindergarten teacher, is to commit the genetic fallacy, right? Even if Miss Crabapple is all of those horrible things, it still may follow that 2 plus 2 equals 4. I cannot assess a view based upon where it comes from alone. Does that make sense? I can't simply dismiss a view or claim that a view is false simply because of where it comes from. And so, you know, uh, husbands, if your wife says to you, you're just saying that because you're a man, okay? She has committed the genetic fallacy, and you probably should point that out at that point, right? <laughs> oh, honey, that's the genetic fallacy. Come on. <laughs> okay, I, I, I can reason decently, but I, I, I can't give marriage advice, okay? So don't follow my marriage advice here. Um, but that would be, but that would be someone saying, oh, you're just a man. Oh, you're just a woman. And discounting your view on that basis is committing the genetic fallacy, right? Here's what how C.S. Lewis put it. Lewis said, you must show that a man is wrong before you start explaining why he is wrong. The modern method is to assume without discussion that he is wrong and then distract his attention from this, the only real issue, by busily explaining how he became so silly. What a great description of what Sigmund Freud has done. Sigmund Freud simply assumes that this view is false, that th there is no God, and now he just distracts us by giving a psychological explanation for the origin of your belief. But F Sigmund Freud's argument commits the genetic fallacy because he's going after the origin or the genesis of your belief, a belief in God. It comes from some place of psychological weakness and then dismissing it. But that's a bad argument. That's the genetic fallacy. And so what we do is we, we, we point that out and say, this is, a, this is a bad argument. It's a fallacious argument. It's not a good argument. You have to show that I'm wrong before you explain why I'm wrong. And so first, the atheist has to show us why Christian theism is false, why I should not think that. So he has to argue not psychologically. He has to argue rationally. And then, if he can demonstrate that Christian theism is false, then he can get around to maybe explaining why he thinks we believe this, even though it's false, okay? But that has to come after you've shown that a man is wrong. Make sense? And so we take another objection. We set it aside. But here's the thing you can do with this objection. You can actually take this objection and turn it on its head. Now, once we demonstrate, of course, we don't want to commit the genetic fallacy either, but once we demonstrate that atheism is false, then we can ask the question, well, why might an atheist hold his or her views if they're false? And here's where uh, this man has done some work on this. His name is Paul Vitz. He's a psychologist at New York uh, University, teaches psychology there. He wrote this book, uh, Faith of the Fatherless. Subtitle, The Psychology of Atheism. <laughs> it's a difficult book to find, 
probably on Amazon, it's pretty expensive. So here, if you want to read a little bit on this or read a good summary of it, simply Google the psychology of atheism, Paul Vitz, and you'll find an article, I don't know how many pages it is, but it'll give you kind of an overview of his book. 